Namaste. One last little video <laughs> before I leave my place and go traveling. Sometimes people ask, how do you get these marvelous insights into the Vedic philosophy? And how do you understand them so clearly that you can put them into practice and actually get the benefits? And there's a one word answer, ontology. What is ontology? You know, it's a very powerful science. You could say it's the science of science. In other words, what happens when a researcher is exploring a new area of knowledge? It could be anything, physics, chemistry, consciousness, you know, whatever. How does the researcher, how does the scientist then structure a field of inquiry so he can make sense out of it? I mean, if you look through a microscope at, let's say, pond water or, you know, anything, some structure of cells from some living being, it just looks like a big mess. How do you make sense of it? How do you make sense of the disconnected Vedic dialogues that seem to just wander all over the map? Ontology. Ontology, ontology, ontology. Ontology is the science of making sciences. That's probably the easiest way to define it. This is what it's good for. This is how to apply it. This is what you can do with it. So the Western mind is used to structured inquiries. And the Eastern mind is more relaxed and open to stories. So how do you take the information that's structured for the Eastern mind in the scriptures and bring it into the Western vocabulary so that it's legible, comprehensible, understandable, and more important than anything, applicable? Uh, how do you get it to where you can do something with it? Ontology. Ontology is, in one sense, terminology. For example, in computer science now, the use of ontologies is very, very prominent in artificial intelligence and so on. And this is where you take a group or network of terminology and you analyze it according to statistical or structural parameters and, and make it into a system, a system that can be queried and which will give legible answers, even in an area of great ambiguity and confusion. So that's exactly what we're facing when we look at the Vedic scriptures. So from the beginning, or actually from about 1999, 2000, I have been using ontology to analyze the Vedic scriptures. And the results have been just way more than I ever expected. So you can learn about ontology here in the Becoming Genius series. And there are downloads, there are links to various resources. Uh, you can use all these tricks or all these methods, actually, very powerful methods to analyze anything. Huh? You might even start to understand your spouse. <laughs> so this is the utility of ontology. And I'm not going to get into an extended explanation of what ontology is or how to use it, because I've already done that in the series that I just linked. So the point is, the Vedic system 
really boils down to two major paths, the path of action and the path of knowledge. Pavriti marg and nivriti marg. Here's that word vritti again. Huh? Remember Patanjali described or defined yoga as chitta nivriti nirodhana. Chitta is mind or consciousness. Vritti is transformation or modification. And nirodhana means complete cessation. So yoga is the complete cessation of modifications of the mind. So similarly, the Vedic path of pravriti means we accept all kinds of transformations. And nivriti means neti neti. We reject all transformations. And we come to the original state of the mind without modifications. Nivriti, no modifications. So this is very confusing to most Westerners because we are used to thinking in terms of a subject-object duality. I do something to some object. Uh, it's there in the structure of our language and the society and everything. The fact that a person, for example, has one legal name throughout their life. Uh, this is a, a subject-object duality because people change so much from being a baby, an infant, a youngster, to being an adolescent, a young adult to a mature adult, and then an old age and finally dwindling and death. They go through so many changes. How can you say that the same name applies to that person throughout their life? It's really not possible. So actually I have taken different names according to my state of being and activities throughout my life. My gurus, each one of them gave me a different name. <laughs> so anyway, the names that we give things matter because we ascribe the qualities derived from the name and superimpose that on the thing that's named. So a person, for example, could have a name like Karen, <laughs> And we immediately associate that with a troublemaker, isn't it? That's because of cultural conditioning. But a name like Priyananda, which happens to be my name these days, is associated with bliss derived from love. And that love is love of the self, love of reality, love of Brahman. Devotion, bhakti, ananya bhakti, devotion to the self. So this is an example of ontology. By giving a person different names according to their state of being and their spiritual evolution and so on, we are saying, recognizing the fact that people change. So in a different social circumstance, one can have different names. When I go downtown to, to the government and try to extend my visa, they are interested in my so-called legal name. But that doesn't really describe who I am, what I am. It only indicates some family affiliation and like that. That's a very limited concept. But a spiritual name reflects the essence of the person, the essence of the individual. And so that can change as they grow and advance spiritually. Similarly, the names that we give things really influence how we perceive them. There's an old saying, give the dog a bad name and shoot it. <laughs> 
that when we want to criticize someone, we give them an ill name. Oh, so-and-so is a sociopath. So-and-so is a narcissist, right? And then we can say, yeah, and they did this and that, and blah, 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 blah. They're a bad person, and so on. Based on the names that we give them. Or we can say, so-and-so is enlightened. So-and-so is a genius. And then we take everything about them in a whole different light. You see? So names matter. Terminology matters. Meaning matters almost more than anything. Because it influences the view that we have of people, places, things, processes, and philosophy, and understanding of life, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's a big deal. So we can say that ontology is a way to generate systems of meaning that reflect the actual nature of a thing and allow us to create models that accurately predict the behavior of that thing. Take, for example, physics. I know from physics that if I pick up an object and then let it go, it's going to fall down. Huh? Unless I happen to be in an accelerating vehicle, in which case it will fall at an angle. These are things that we can predict from simple physics like Newton's laws of motion. And of course, it gets more and more elaborate and advanced. But that's the basic principle. So now let's look at something like consciousness. We can predict, based on an ontology of consciousness, how a person is going to behave, how they're going to act, what resources they have available to them based on their state of consciousness. For example, a person whose consciousness is basically jagrat, focused on the objects of the world seen through the senses. They are going to have a certain belief, which we call dvaita vada, a certain view of the world based on this subject-object duality. But a more thoughtful person a person who lives more in their mind than in their body is going to be in svapna consciousness, consciousness of thoughts, consciousness of the mind, of the inner energy. They are going to see things in a very different way that we call vashishta dvaita vada the view that ultimately things are one and all the different objects that we see are only apparent, only illusions, and so on and so on until we reach the highest state of consciousness, Turiya, in which there are no boundaries, no distinctions, no actions, no changes, not even consciousness. So this is the modeling of the human behavior based on consciousness and the citta vritti, the modifications of the mind. Now, in Turiya, there are no modifications, but in all the other states of consciousness, there are. And so one can very reliably predict what the awareness of that person is going to be based on their state of consciousness their habitual focus of consciousness. So a sage who is always in meditation is centered on sushupti consciousness, consciousness of the ineffable, emptiness, nothingness, the silence. And this is the state that leads to final enlightenment. We can know this through ontology. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. 
ओम नमः शिवाय